Welcome back to The Heat. China joined the World Trade Organization 15 years ago with the belief it would be recognized this week as a market economy. Both the United States, the European Union and Japan are refusing to comply. Let's get back to our panel right now. In Yukon, talking about the situation getting politicized, the president-elect Donald Trump here in the United States has vowed to slap heavy import tariffs on Chinese goods. Um, is trade protectionism at work here and why is it rearing its head again? Well, it's a convenient excuse to deal with an issue, and it's not appropriate. It's not really appropriate. Uh, China's uh, exchange rate has been uh, moving up, both up and down, over the last 10 years. Uh, most people who look at it very carefully agree that China's no longer manipulating the exchange rate. Uh, it's actually, if it is doing it, it's trying to prevent it from becoming too cheap rather than too, too, uh, too strong. And so it's the opposite direction. I think the concern is jobs, as previous speakers have said. I, I think it's an interesting note, however, that employment and manufacturing in the United States has actually been increasing over the last three to four years in absolute numbers, whereas employment and manufacturing in China has actually been declining in the last three to four years. China's actually maturing. It's becoming like the United States. It's the uh, manufacturing sector's job increases have been actually declining, and it's moving to uh, Vietnam is moving to Bangladesh, it's moving to India. It's yeah. growing in the services. Right, the perception is that it's the other way around. That's right. Yeah. And here's the basic point. Historically, manufacturing and agriculture, because of productivity increases, uh, jobs decline steadily over time. Sometimes very quickly, sometimes more slowly, but inevitably. And the growth, as you become richer and richer, shows up in services. And the big debate is, has productivity increased jobs in services? as opposed to the fact that it's reduced jobs in manufacturing. Actually, most studies show that productivity increases or automation in services actually increase jobs. So the future is not so gloomy as people make, but you have these cycles, and these cycles can be extremely disruptive. KU, from China's point of view, uh, it has fulfilled WTO obligations this past 15 years. As Daniel pointed out at the beginning of the program, uh, China agreed to play by Western rules. It has done so for the past 15 years. So. What options does China have now? What's next? Well, I think that you know this is a this is a question of uh, negotiation and um, continued debate. And um, you know, I think that China will change its tactic uh, going forward. But you know, one thing to remember is that China's economic structure is also changing at the same time, uh, as was previously mentioned. China, on the other hand, is developing more services. Its services has is still occupying a very low share of GDP and uh, manufacturing uh, relatively is on the decline. So I think um, going forward, we have, already sh we have already seen that Chinese exports have climbed up uh, the quality and skill ladder. So you know, in that sense, its comparative advantage in terms of just cheap labor is running out anyways. Um, I think what we're seeing as this kind of unfair competition or anti-dumping and these complaints about the West is a reflection that China is just producing things cheaply, which in fact is a good thing for many countries on the recipient recipient end. I want to emphasize one thing which is um, grossly uh, neglected um, in the discussions about trade with China, which is that Chinese imports into the U.S. and Europe had hugely benefit consumers and particularly poor households, because poor households consume a disproportionate amount of uh, Chinese goods and Im imports. So that has actually kept inflation at bay. I find it fascinating that this benefit um, does not get brought off. And in fact, you know, anti-dumping duties, uh, things on, you know, things like uh, refrigerators, et cetera, and washing machines are actually going to hurt U.S. and European consumers. That's right. Uh, the United States imposed tariffs on washing machines just this past Friday. Shada, the uh, former WTO chief Pascal Lamy has said that ultimately China will be granted market economy status, but that the WTO would have to change its anti-dumping rules. Uh, if we look at it that way, uh, are all the countries in the European Union going to agree to that? Yeah, Pascal Lamy has said that. He said it to me as well. I think he's right, because when he was head of the, direct, uh, of the WTO, he did try to change the anti-dumping rules. As I said, they're really 20th century based, and some of the panelists have pointed out to some of the discon disconnects that exist. Uh, I think he's right. I think the European Union is trying to beef up its own anti-dumping measures on, uh, inside among the 27, 28 countries. So I think, yes, the EU agrees and believes, but it's very 
difficult to get the 27-28 countries on board. I just wanted to add a couple of things. Um, the, it's very important to remember that one of the issues that the EU has with China at the moment is access to markets, and that's especially in the services sector. There's also a belief here that investing in China is quite restricted for Europeans. So, you know, it's this debate is not just about market economy status, it's actually about a wider issue of how easy is it to establish uh, companies, to set up joint ventures, etc. in China, how easy is it to access the market of services. And I think these are the issues that China has to clarify. I'd like to say again, I wish that, you know, that the tempers that have risen on both sides, and I wish people would calm down and look at ways of getting out of this uh, conundrum that they've created. It's self-created. China's market is huge and enormous and very important to the European Union. Germany's expansion and economic future really depends on how Chinese economy does access to Chinese markets. We rely on China for a lot of, a lot of our growth. It's an interdependent situation. So we can't really... We can't really afford a trade war with China, and I hope it doesn't come to that. I hope people cool down and look at the bigger, wider picture of, you know, collective, collective growth. Daniel, China is the largest trading partner with uh, 120 WTO member states. It's made a significant contribution to trade and investment over the past 15 years. Do you think it's getting enough recognition for what it's done? Well, I think it's a symbiotic relationship in the first place. China needs the West in trade terms, and the West needs China. And I think uh, we, we need to look at it in those terms. We need to look at it in the terms of uh, trade liberalization in general benefits everyone. And you've seen a huge um, uh, sort of growth in uh, GDP in China and a huge uh, move out of poverty for many hundreds of millions of people in China as a result of trade. And as was pointed out earlier, we've, we've had lower prices for consumer goods in the West as a result of it. So I do think we need to maybe uh, sell the, the merits of trade je uh, in general, and China certainly has played its part in that, uh, I think, by agreeing to, the, to join the WTO back in 2001. You can't, is this a public relations problem here? As Daniel point, pointed out, uh, one needs to sell the merits of trade. I think that's a, a problem for politicians everywhere these days. Uh, with the employment, uh, wage concerns, free trade, the so-called benefits of free trade, the, the benefits to consumers, as one of the speakers mentioned, have not been highlighted. So I think we have to go back to the drawing boards more, more and basically lay out a, what I call a message which resonates with the public about why it is still good to improve or increase the trade regime while globalization in these processes is sensible. Uh, I might just mention that there are some vehicles for addressing some of the more heated concerns. There's a bilateral investment treaty negotiation with the U.S. There's a bilateral investment treaty negotiation with Europe. Some of these questions about access need to be addressed as a form for it. The Chinese have actually proposed a, a free trade agreement for East Asia as a broad measure because of the TPP has passed away. And again, that's another framework for actually talking to the U.S. and China a little bit more about some of these anti-dumping, these prices, these trade concerns. Kayu, from the, you know, China's role in the G20 to APEC, it's played a leading role in promoting free trade and economic integration. Uh, now we see this debate on market economy status. Do you think that would change China's free trade policies? Um, no, I think in essence it, it, it will not. I think China is really ch one of the true champions and also one of the biggest um, uh, benefactors of um, you know, globalization. I think it will inherently uh, continue. That said, um, as we, we have discussed earlier, the re retaliation uh, tactic uh, might uh, occur in the short term, but that won't change the overall long-term uh, policy to, uh, for trade integration. Because let's also not forget, apart from trade in integration, globalization also um, comprises of um, financial integration, which will be critical for China's next step in terms of future growth. Daniel, what is the United Kingdom's approach to uh, its trade relationship with China? Do you think the UK would recognize China as a market uh, economy uh, after it, le it, you know, it formally leaves the European Union? Well, I think one of the big reasons for the leaving the European Union was to grow our trade outside of the EU. Uh, so China is obviously the key market for that. So it's going to be in the UK's interest very much to uh, foster as smooth trade relations as possible with China. I think the market economy status issue has got very politicized, even in the UK, because we have issues 
with our steel uh, manufacturing in the UK as well. Um, but I think in general, the UK approach would be probably to try and go beyond the EU uh, in terms of the bilateral agreements and, and try and go straight to, uh, to negotiating a free trade agreement with China, which is something I know China have been wanting to start negotiations with the EU for some time uh, and have been sort of pushed back. So I think the UK will certainly be looking at uh, better trade relations with China. With regards to market economy status, I, I think that possibly is a bit of a red herring. I think the UK will want to have as smooth relations as possible with China.